Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, before we begin our presentation, I want to give you a Stay Sharp program update. If you could advance the slide, Dr. Carlton. Our uh, next small group foundational program begins on Friday, October 7th at 1 o'clock p.m. This Stay Sharp coaching program offers a unique opportunity for those looking to preserve their cognition or who are just beginning to notice lapses in their memory. And this allows them to take a more active role in enhancing their brain health. The groups are facilitated by a health coach and bolstered by peer support in a secure supportive setting, which is online. Included in the program are two private consultations with a Sharp Again coach, health coach, six 75 minute coaching group calls via Zoom. We have a comprehensive manual and workbook to help you stay on track and you have access to an online assessment to measure core elements of your cogn cognitive function, along with a lot of other educational resources. Each program is limited to eight participants. And one recent participant, participant told me his favorite part of the program was that it focused on four topics, nutrition, sleep, exercise, and stress. You get a taste of everything, time for it to sink in, and then you use that knowledge to make effective changes. He said his stress levels have improved greatly because he has taken steps to do something about it, and reducing his stress level has improved his sleep. Um, this program is only $79. Um, we are able to offer it at this very low price because we have a generous grant from a, a foundation. Uh, I'm just admitting a couple more people. Uh, our next two webinars, if you could advance that slide again for me, Dr. Carlton. Oops, sorry. I need, I'm trying to mute at the same time. Um, our next two webinars are open for registration. The APO E4 gene is our next topic, and that's on Thursday, October 20th. And then we have Better Detox Equals Better Brain on Wednesday, November 9th. Um, so I'm done with my program update. Welcome to our September webinar presentation, How to Manage Stress, Depression, and Anxiety to Help Prevent Memory Loss. Please note the information in this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Our information is intended to empower individuals, their families, and healthcare professionals who want to collaborate in the most effective ways on this journey to health and well being. Yeah, I know. Please. Sorry. Um, Please see a licensed and qualified medical professional for your medical needs. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Richard Carlton. Dr. Carlton is an integrative psychiatrist and pioneer in the rational use of nutrition-based treatment approaches when treating mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and ADHD, or physical problems such as cognitive impairment, dementia, PMS, migraines, and IBS. He practices in Port Washington, New York, and is a member of the Stay Sharp Naturally Medical and Dental Advisory Board. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type in, them in the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Dr. Carlton, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Joan, and thank you to Sharp again naturally for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to give this talk. I want to give you a little bit of background. What's a psychiatrist doing dealing with nutrition? And what's nutrition got to do with dementia? Why is a psychiatrist treating dementia? Should be the neurologist. So I graduated medical school, medical school in 1969, New York Medical College. And in my medical training, I really didn't like the prescription medications. We had this big fat book called the Physician's Desk Reference. <clears throat> couple of thousand pages. 
and probably 2,000 pages of that were just side effects. And if you judiciously studied the side effects of what you were being asked to prescribe, it was horrifying. So by the time I finished my psych residency at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center, I got into private practice. I was really looking for ways <clears throat> to treat illnesses naturally as much as possible. I'm glad all these years later, 50 years later, that I have prescription medications I can fall back on as um, a last resort because they're really fabulous and they can do those medications, can do some things that nutrients can't do. But in my experience, about 75% of all the psychiatric problems and all the medical problems that have come to my office over these 50 years, 75% of the problems can be helped by changing the diet, mainly getting rid of foods that are really offensive to the brain or to the tissues of the body. We'll talk about that. Um, giving nutrient supplements, um, giving herbs that I've learned to use that are really phenomenally effective. I want to delve for a moment before we really start the main body of the talk as to why giving a nutrient could possibly help with anxiety or could possibly help with dementia. So the brain and the other organs of the body are always making things. There's this whole chemical machinery going on all the time to make neurotransmitters, to make intermediate metabolites in the liver, to transform this into that. And many of the metabolic machineries, the things that are being made, are reliant on essential nutrients, like vitamin B6, vitamin B1, vitamin B2. And a lot of doctors think that all you need is the minimum daily requirement, like two milligrams of vitamin B1, five milligrams of vitamin B6. That's okay. Those levels are okay to prevent a deficiency state like scurvy, beriberi, pellagra, we don't see those deficiency diseases in the United States, not in 2022. In the 1800s, we saw those, those diseases. Nobody, unless they're starving, is deficient in these vitamins. But if you give a larger pharmacological amount of some of these vitamins and minerals and fatty acids, you can cause a big increase in the production of your neurotransmitters. And that can improve mood, can improve cognition, um, can stop seizures, can help dementia, as you'll see. So with that background, that physiological amounts of nutrients in the diet aren't enough, that's a garden hose. You can't use a garden hose to put out a fire. You need a fire hose to put out a fire. So larger amounts than just the diet will provide. So in the talk today, we're going to define terms. We're talking about stress, depression, and anxiety. We'll define them a little bit. We'll talk about the evidence that those states favor cognitive impairment. We'll talk about the mechanisms whereby those states favor cognitive impairment. We'll talk about approaches to prevention and treatment, you know, the conventional approaches, which is medications, the behavioral approaches, and nutritional herbal metabolic approaches. And I'll take you through two case histories. One will be successful coping on the cognitive level, the behavioral level, with the enormous stress of caregiving, my caregiving for my late wife with her severe Parkinson's. I'll take you through that, although it's sad. Um, the second case history will be a patient with extreme dementia. He was in oblivion, and I brought him back from oblivion with nutrition, nutrients and herbs. So defining terms, stress, you all know it's, um, feeling as they're too put upon, things are weighing down on you, there's too much to do. You're too, remember the comedian on Saturday Night Live would say you're sedrate. Um, depression, you know, you feel a low mood, anxiety, you're tense. The reason I'm, you all know what these are, but the thing that's in common is that these have an effect on the brain structures, especially the hippocampus, which I'm gonna show you later. And they do so by increasing cortisol. And that high cortisol, when we're stressed, when we're not sleeping, when we're depressed, can really literally physically shrink the hippocampus and ruin our memory, our cognitive approach, to the ability to remember things. So I want to impress upon you, because it's not self-evident that stress could change a physical structure like the hippocampus. 
So I want to tell you that's something that cardiologists have learned in the last, I think, 20 years. People who have pathological mourning, they've lost a loved one, and they're grieving and grieving endlessly for month after month. They're not resolving their grief. They're dwelling in it. They can get a change in the physical structure of the heart, particularly the atrium of the heart. And it's called Takatsubo disease, T-A-K-E-T-S-U-B-O, which in Japanese means um, like an urn, like a little pouch for holding liquid. So the atrium changes from its normal, that, that's the top chamber of the heart, the HEP2 atrium, which pump into the ventricle. The atrium changes its physical shape into like a vessel. And along with that come tremendous abnormalities of heart function. So that grieving, that stress can cause physical changes in the body, including the brain. And that's why it's so important that we get a hold of these stress, depression, and anxiety. Um, so we don't let it wreck the body and cause us to have dementia. There are really things that you can do about it. Don't to be a victim. So the evidence. Um, I had originally sent some slides to Joan showing some literature references, but they were very complicated and you know terminology that a layman wouldn't grasp. So Joan very kindly just uh, converted into a layman's language. But if you're interested in getting the actual references, Joan can send those to you. Anyway, the, the literature shows Have that I, late. Go Dr. ahead, go ahead, Joan. Yeah. Dr. Carlton, can I interrupt? Please. Your, micro your microphone is getting a little scratchy. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Thank okay. You. If it happens again, just tell me. Okay. So just point like this and I'll see you. Okay. Okay. So, um, what the studies show is that depression provo promotes depression, the dementia, um, insomnia pro promotes dementia, stress promotes dementia. The literature, the evidence is there in the literature. I just, I'm not really going to take the time to review you, just take my word for it, but it's there if you want to find out about it. So, what are the treatment approaches? There's the conventional approaches like prescription medications, behavioral approaches, we're going to discuss these, and nutritional herbal metabolic approaches. So the prescription medications, they're basically acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And I'm going to explain what that means. So remember we talked a moment ago that the brain makes neurotransmitters. Well, one of the most important neurotransmitters for memory formation and memory retrieval, I'm going to mute my phone. Um, is acetylcholine, ACH, acetylcholine. So that's a neurotransmitter. When a neurotransmitter acts on a receptor, it gives a signal to the downstream neuron to fire. And so you form a memory, for example. But that neurotransmitter gets degraded, metabolized, because it should stop signaling. You don't want Western Union ringing your doorbell all day long, right? Got to go home. Thanks for the message. Go home. So similar with a neurotransmitter, when it acts, it gets degraded by acetylcholinesterase in this case. If you could inhibit acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme, then you'd have more acetylcholine, and that could promote more memory. Doesn't do a very good job. Maybe some of you have experience with yourselves or with loved ones on donepezil, rivastigmine, stigmine, galantamine. I have seen them work a little bit. I don't normally prescribe them, but patients of mine who were seeing a neurologist who started these, I did see some slight improvements in word recall, word fluidity. Um, but on the whole, they don't stop the downward spiral into dementia. They slow it down. So instead of a steep plunge like that, it's a more shallow plunge. But if you're the loved one, you're still seeing your loved one go down, losing more and more memory, more and more word recall, and the inability to speak, and ability to remember their own names or your names, you know, all the features. It's just going slower, but you don't know they're slower. You don't know what speed it would have been. So it's great that they slow it down, but they're not doing enough. And they can't stop the severe agitation of dementia. One of the problems 
is that as you're going to see later on, the brain can't make enough of the acetylcholine because of the defects in metabolism of the brain that can't utilize glucose to drive the Krebs cycle. I'm getting a little technical, but the bottom line is can't make enough acetylcholine. So if you're not making enough, then these medications don't have anything to scavenge. So they're not going to work very well. How about making more acetylcholine? That has been the whole thrust of my practice since 1975 when I started doing this to help the brain to make more of the neurotransmitters it needs. And then these medications can work much better. I hope that makes sense to you. So what about behavioral approaches? Yoga, mindfulness meditation are very important tools for getting control of your stress, for improving your ability to sleep, controlling anxiety. Um, there are double blind studies showing that these approaches work. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time pounding the table on this, but if you really want to find a way to slow down the damage that stress is doing, if you're a loved one, caring for someone with dementia, caring for somebody with cancer, brother Parkinson's dreadful conditions, you can't avoid the stress. The stress is gonna be there because of what you're subject to. And I know that from personal experience, what you can control is the effect that the stress has on your organism. If you get back into the breathing, let your weight down to the ground, learn the, the techniques of mindfulness meditation, yoga breathing, you can very significantly, significantly blunt the effects of stress and insomnia, depression, anxiety on your brain. Because in essence, these approaches are working like shock absorbers, like struts to diminish the impact of those stresses on your brain, especially on the hippocampus. And I wanted to talk to you about thought management. It's my own term. I'm not talking about thought control. There's some techniques in the 1960s and 70s about thought control. We're not trying to control your thinking. We're trying to do thought husbandry. So a lot of people think that when a thought comes into the mind, that they have to think about the thought. And that's not true. Just because a thought comes into your mind, like, oh, my husband needs his medications and we're out. My wife needs to get a new aid and I can't find a new aid. The agency isn't coming up, coming up with anybody. And these thoughts are bombarding you and plaguing you. After you've had the thought once or twice, you need to be able to stop that thought from acting on you. You can't stop it from coming up into the mind. The thought will come up. What you can do is to refuse to give it attention. Just because the thought is there doesn't mean you have to give it attention. And you could wind up giving it a lot of attention, 100% of your attention to some <sighs> horrible thought that drives you to a state of despair when you were perfectly fine six seconds ago before that thought came up. You don't have to go to what's called DEFCON 6 just because a thought came up. You can say to that thought, thank you. Had that thought five minutes ago and two hours before that. Don't need to think about it right now. Thanks very much. And that thought comes up again. Nope, I'm not going to think about you. There is um, an evangelical minister who gives talks on Sunday on channel, Sundays on Channel 4. And I don't like it when he gets all religious. I'm Jewish. I don't like all his hyper-religious stuff. What's, I'm blocking on his name, but he says some really practical things, Joel Austin. And one of the things that I love that he said of just changing channels on a Sunday morning, he was talking about these thoughts that come into your mind repetitively, endlessly. He says, don't invite them in and don't invite them to sit down, sit down with you and watch television and don't offer them popcorn. I love that. So just because the thought has come into your mind, doesn't mean you have to think about it. Does not mean you have to think about it. Don't feed it. Don't give it your energy. 
And you can use various techniques like humor to make fun of the thought. You can use anger you can tell it to knock it off and get really angry at it. But don't allow yourself to keep thinking about it endlessly, endlessly. It'll keep you up at night. And what you can say to yourself at night, if you wake up and your worries start to plague you, you say to yourself, okay, I was thinking about that during the day. And if I think about it at four o'clock in the morning now, I'm not going to make any more progress on it than I was during the day. So you know what? We're not going to think about you right now. Da, 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 da. Nope, I'm not thinking about you now. And if you keep at it, if you really diligently pursue this approach of thought management, you will get the power of the thoughts to diminish. Thinking is only one function of the brain. It shouldn't be the be all and the end all and control your entire existence. Thinking is a tool to figure things out. You mustn't let it dominate your life. Okay, I hope that makes sense to you. Now I wanna show you about the hippocampus. There's two of them, the hippocampi. The very deep subcortical nuclei, deep inside the brain, um, towards the bottom is the top of the brain. And <clears throat> when you try to remember something like what school you went to in elementary school. So the memory is stored someplace around the brain and it comes through the hippocampus and goes really to someplace else so you can remember it. And how much is two plus two? So you retrieve that from someplace in the brain and it comes through the hippocampus. And so you know how much is two plus two, you know where you went to elementary school, you know the name of your wife, you know the name of your grandchildren. It's all going through this relay station of the hippocampus, one side or the other. When you form a new memory, okay, what are we gonna do at two o'clock today? We're gonna go see the cardiologist. Okay, that memory gets formed, goes the other way. So these circuits go through the hippocampus. A neurologist giving a talk 25 years ago said, that if he wanted to create a lesion two millimeters in size, someplace in the brain that would destroy memory, destroy your ability to recall past events and destroy your ability to lay down new memory, where would he go to make this lesion? In the outer layer of the hippocampus, there's a couple of like six or seven layers, just snip the outer layer and you are lost. You don't remember your wife's name. You don't remember your children's name. You don't remember your own name. You become incontinent. You are lost. You're in oblivion. So these little nuclei are tremendously important. Now, for this presentation, I just Googled, because I, I wanted to give you some pictures of so you could see what the hippocampus is like. And what I happened to come up with just happened to be about an article on CBD, cannabidiol which is the non-psychoactive component of hemp and marijuana. And it's very useful for insomnia. It's very useful for dementia. And THC is very useful for dementia. Anyway, it just so happens what this study shows is that CBD improves blood flow in the hippocampus. How about that? What's really important to know is that if you take Yoga adepts, people have been doing yoga five, 10, 15 years, and put them in an MRI machine, measure the size of the hippocampus, hippocampi. They're bigger than the controls. Aging and particularly the dementia process will shrink the hippocampi. Obesity will shrink the hippocampi. Stress will shrink these organs. The more you shrink them, the more memory you're losing. It's not that the memories are stored there and they're relayed there. This is the Bell Laboratories, the Bell Telephone Relay System for memory retrieval and memory formation. If you shrink this, you lose the neurons that can give you the memory. So you see how important the hippocampi are to memory. Therefore, you see how important it is to control cortisol. That's the stress hormone made by the adrenal glands because the cortisol from undue stress, endless stress, 
is just going to wreck these hippocampi. So don't try to write down all these nutrients and herbs that would be helpful. You'll be able to get these from the um, by looking at the slideshow. And John could also send you a link to the slideshow. Um, but I just want to very quickly list for you all the things that I've been finding helpful in treating my patients with dementia. Coconut oil is one of the biggest. I'll tell you why. In a, well, let me tell you why now. So it turns out that, that the brain is a hybrid engine, just like a, some cars can use ethanol as well as gas, gasoline. So the brain can use glucose. That's its main fuel. But it can also use ketone bodies. Those are fatty acid derivatives from the breakdown of fats. And coconut oil will provide the ketones that go into the brain, into the neurons, and provide fuel. Well, what goes wrong? Why would the brain not be able to use glucose? Because the insulin receptors on many neurons become damaged in dementia. And when the insulin, insulin receptors are damaged, glucose can't get in. If glucose can't get in, you can't drive energy metabolism. You can't make acetyl acetylcholine on A, and then you can't make acetylcholine. If you can't make acetylcholine, you can't remember things. And then those medications we we're talking about, the nepazil and the others, they're not going to work because you're, you're not making enough acetylcholine. So coconut oil can solve this problem because it's an alternate fuel for the brain. And then there's essential nutrients. There's the fish oil, omega-3s. The data is not conclusive about that. There are high quality versions of certain key herbs and nutraceuticals. Bacopa is a blessing, it's a godsend. Skullcap, curcumin, which is the main ingredient in turmeric. And that's really helpful for arthritis and for COVID, long haul COVID. So I have 10, 10 out of 10 of my long COVID patients were, were helped overnight with curcumin. And by the way, I use nano curcumin by One Planet Nutrition. Nano curcumin, it's small particles. One Planet Nutrition, you can get that on Amazon. They're antioxidants that quench neuroinflammation. A big problem in dementia is that there's a lot of inflammation going on in the brain. And Polyphenols like luteolin and quercetin, which are from plants, um, really help to quench the neural inflammation and protect the brain. Then there are phytochemicals that restore the reduced cerebral blood flow and reduce cerebral metabolism. It's very well known, axiomatic in neurology, that in dementia, the brain is shrinking and circulation is tremendously decreased. Well, Circulation can be increased, brain circulation can be increased with ginkgo biloba and N acetyl carnitine. Now, medical cannabis and CBD, I want to talk to you about the pros and cons. Um, this is really important for you to remember. For the agitation of dementia, THC, which is the active ingredient of cannabis, the drug, what you get when you smoke and get high, THC blunts, stops the agitation. And in studies that have been done in nursing homes where they have agitated dementia patients, these patients become calm, the anxiety goes away, they stop kicking and hitting and scratching and biting. They're still demented, but they are peaceful and serene, and their appetite goes up, which is great because, as you probably know, they stop eating. They start getting emaciated. And so medical cannabis helps them to stay in better control. The neurologist who was giving a talk on the subject when I first learned about this, he said, the one side effect that you, you get from medical cannabis treating dementia patients is euphoria. What's wrong with euphoria? He said, America is euphorophobic. We don't like people getting happy and cheerful. Well, what's wrong with it? If you could take somebody who's screaming and kicking 
and hitting everybody and won't eat and so nasty. They can't help it. They're demented. They don't know what to do and they can't help it. If you could take them from that state and give them, it doesn't have to be smoked, you know, it can be um, an oil that you take under the tongue or a lozenge that you chew on. If you can give them the THC and two or three days later, they're calm and pleasant and peaceful. What a blessing. So please keep that in mind. And in many states like New York, it's perfectly legal to get medical cannabis from the dispensaries. I'm a medical provider for cannabis. Um, I can help you with that. Now there's meets and bounds. You cannot, must not give THC to somebody with active unstable heart disease like angina or recent heart attack. If you've, ever, if you've ever gotten overly stoned, you know it's a commotion and it's a strain on the heart. People sweat, they get red, uh, the heart pounds, and that increases the metabolic oxygen demands of the heart. And if somebody has unstable angina, you can provoke a heart attack. So if somebody with angina thinks it's okay for them to smoke and they're not demented, they, they, they have good enough cog cog cognition to think they can smoke marijuana and they're having angina, tell them to stop. It can really cause heart attacks. Look it up, ask them to look it up and they'll find it. But other than that, oh, of course, too much THC can provoke psychosis. There's no question about that. Um, and by the way, CBD cannabidiol can overcome the psychosis that THC provokes. That's very well established. And many of us are using CBD to control the psychosis of bipolar disease. And it works really well. So please keep those in mind. And finally, on this slide, there are beneficial dietary approaches. Sharp again naturally has given presentations on the MIND diet and the Bredesen diet, Mediterranean diet. Basically, what you want to do in summary is get rid of all the sugar and ice cream and the glop that abounds in the Western diet, especially the American diet. The American diet is, a, frankly, it's a disaster. Um, it's just an invitation to Alzheimer's and diabetes, diabetes type 2, and heart attacks and liver failure and um, other kinds of problems. Chocolate is one of the main enemies and people really groan when they hear this. So I wanna tell you a very quick story. 27 year old woman, college graduate, although she had a lot of trouble graduating, was referred to me by a cognitive behavioral therapist who's very well known in that world, writes books on the subject. He told me that this woman has a lot of intelligence. She should be able to utilize the cognitive and behavioral approaches, but they're not sinking in. He knows there's something metabolically going on. He says, do your magic. I know you be able to figure this out. It was chocolate. She wasn't having a lot of it, just three or four times a week, a little bit. She got off it. And within three weeks, all her depression cleared up. She stopped crying all, all morning. She had not been able to get out of bed till three in the afternoon a total failure in life, 27 years old and not able to work because of just crying every day, brain fog. Within three weeks, she was fine. She gave a dinner party. At the dinner party, she had bought a chocolate cake and she served herself a sliver. And the next three days, she was in bed till three o'clock in the afternoon, crying all the time, brain fog. The whole thing was recapitulated. She got off chocolate for good. Six months later, she was enrolled at Hunter College, became a clinical psychologist. A year later, she was married. I got a card in the mail from the wedding. A year after that, the first baby, I got a card. A year later, the card for the second baby. All I did was take her off of chocolate. Now, people are going to tell me, what about the antioxidants? Well, you can get antioxidants from plants, other plants. You don't need to get, to get them from the coffee, the chocolate bean, cocoa bean. Um, because the cocoa bean has lectins, L-A-C-T-A-N, that will inflame the brain. And it's a whole topic. I don't have the time to tell you about it, but brain inflammation from foods like dairy, chocolate, 
and some for some people gluten can really inflame the brain and make you depressed and anxious and have insomnia and you'll get dementia so you want to get rid of the crap the glop that's on the typical american diet go mediterranean go bredesen go mind look it up and you'll see is healthy foods is really a plant-based diet with maybe a little bit of meat a little bit of fish but the meat sizes don't take up the whole plate and it's not seven days a week we're nearing the end of the talk now so behavioral coping with a tremendous stress, stress of caregiving um basically i had to practice all of those techniques i was telling you about in dealing with my wife's descent into parkinson's and in the last year or so of the parkinson's was the dementia she i mean the issue well she was hallucinating to get visual hallucinations and so there were cranes outside the window putting in hot tubs in people's backyards and their parades going up and down the street and although she was bed bound she was convinced that she could walk around the bedroom and go down the stairs to let people in and i almost had to strap her into her lazy boy chair because she was pushing the button and trying to get out of the chair in her psychosis so it was a tremendous burden but i was able to sleep almost every night without insomnia just by turning off the thinking and sometimes a thought would come up as when i was saying to myself you know that's a good thought tomorrow morning around 10 a.m. i'm going to think about what you the brain just gave me to think about thank you very much now shut off i'm not going to think about it again but you know shut up because if you don't stop it if you don't do this husbandry it will keep at all night long and you won't sleep and all day long and you'll be mm, an agita you don't have to be a victim of your thought processes i hope this is getting through you don't have to be a victim of it don't be a slave to your thinking put your thinking in its place don't give it popcorn um so now i want to talk to you about nutrition and herbal treatment of advanced dementia so around 2003 new york academy of sciences sent out a brochure that they were going to have an upcoming um, please mute yourselves if you are not muted um they were going to give a seminar on type dementia as type 3 diabetes type 3 diabetes what is that how to find out so i went and they, they showed slide after slide study after study that in dementia the glucose receptor the glu that takes glucose into the neurons under the influence of the insulin but if the insulin receptor is damaged which it is in dementia then you can't get glucose in if you can't get glucose in the neuron dies it doesn't have fuel and i walked out of there saying well i'm a systems engineer i figured out how to work around the problem if there's a detour there's going to be a work run in nutrition what would be the work run oh duh it's obvious give ketone bodies give coconut oil now i didn't know that others had been thinking about it in 2003 i thought i was the first one to come up with that idea oh brilliant you're going to be famous well there was a woman named she was a doctor i'm blocking her name she wrote a book the end of dementia she was wrong it's not the end of dementia but she talked about how uh, i'm sorry i can't remember her name uh, the exact name of the book john do you remember it uh, mary anyway i'll i'll send it to you later she talked about her own husband having dementia and he couldn't do the clock drawing a clock putting the hand the hours on it and making the time is a very complex issue and when when her husband tried to do it with a neurologist the numbers for the clock face were off the clock and so were the hands off the clock so he was very demented and she gave him coconut oil and within 3 weeks he could draw a clock and he was tremendously improved 
So I said to myself, darn, I didn't discover that somebody else did, but I can't wait to get a dementia patient so I can give them coconut oil because you got to give them ketones to get into the brain as a fuel for the neurons. If glucose can't get in, ketones will. There's no receptor, it just diffuses in. Ketone bodies just diffuse in and drive the Krebs cycle. Now you can make acetylcholine because you can make acetylcholine A-C-O-A, -A, acetylcholine A. I know it's a lot about chemistry, but this is how the brain works. So I waited and waited and one day I made contact with a woman psychologist who I had worked with 20 years earlier at a nutritional clinic with her and her husband. She is a PhD, her husband is an MD. I called her and I said, how's your husband? Oh, he's severely demented. He's in a nursing home right now, he's in the hospital, gets pneumonias all the time, he gets really bad shape, he's close to death, close to death. I said, let me see him. I think I can maybe help him. So this was the story, the background before I show you what I did. In 2007, before his descent, he was functioning at 100%, practicing psychiatrist. Joan, how much time do we have? Can I hear you? We have about 15 minutes. Terrific. So we want about five for some Q&A. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run through this. Running a private clinic, authoring chapters on the regulation of monoamine neurotransmitters, dancing tango with his wife, loves his children and grandchildren, gets a stroke. Why does he get a stroke? He's an Argentinian physician and his backyard are two grills. Steak, 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 always charred. Don't eat charred, you can have steak, don't char it. You really promote dementia with, and heart, heart disease with a charring. Um, and his only vegetable is tomato, that's it. No vegetables, so he was a real candidate for strokes. And second stroke takes him down even further. There is no rating scale for the general activity of daily living, GAD, for this much of a decline. I had to make up my own rating scale. Then he has a third stroke in 2010. And with that third stroke, no longer able to walk on his own, no longer able to swallow. Peg tube was installed into the stomach from the chest wall, the stomach wall for gastric feeding, incontinent times two, meaning of urine and feces, fully demented. And then he has November, 2011, two bouts of bronchopneumonia with antibiotic induced diarrhea. He's screaming when I see him from perianal excoriations, the diarrhea was ripping his anus, catabolic meaning wasted, racked by coughing. And I see him to evaluate, evaluate him in March of 2012 untestable on the exams. semi stuporous his chin was like this, not talking, can't draw a clock. I hand him pencil and paper, ask him to draw a clock. He just looked at the pencil, didn't take the paper. Has no idea that he was a physician, doesn't know his wife's name, doesn't know that he has children, children and grandchildren, doesn't know he's born and raised in Argentina. When I asked him, what's your name? He said, if I knew that I could get out. I said afterwards to his wife, wow, I sense there's somebody in there. If I could connect the cylinders to the drivetrain, I think we could get somewhere. And I think that Coke and oil and some other nutrients could help. She said, let's go for it. I asked her to start them one at a time because I was really interested to see what the effect would be of the coconut oil and this various nutrients one by one. She started them all at once. I can't blame her. He was close to dying. So here's what happened. I'm going to take you through this complicated slide step by step. This is his level of functioning after the third stroke, but before his two bouts of pneumonia. Then in March, when I see him, it's 5%. I mean, he's not in a complete stupor, a complete, complete coma. He was able to tell me. If he could remember his name, he could get out. And if he couldn't walk by himself, but if the wife and the aide picked him up by 
his armpits, he could drag his feet like that. So that was the level of functioning, 5%. So I put him on these nutrients, coconut oil, acetylcarnitine arginate, and CDP choline. Two weeks later, he starts walking unassisted, chews and swallows for the first time. Let me tell you what actually happened. So the wife is giving him these first set of nutrients. One day he's in the kitchen in his wheelchair. He gets up from his chair unassisted, takes a piece of fennel, you know, the vegetable fennel, which is very chewy, puts it in his mouth. Now I saw him when they tried to give him a pill, he wouldn't take anything by mouth because he knew he would gag on it and choke on it. He got up, took a piece of fennel, the aide wanted to go take the fennel out of his mouth because she didn't want to have to do a Heimlich maneuver. The wife said, wait, he chewed it and swallowed. Went back to the chair by himself. Another day he got up by himself and took a sharp knife and cut a piece of cheese. I said to the wife, put away the sharp knives. He's still demented. And then a couple of weeks later, he goes to the basement door to go downstairs to talk to the aide. I said, lock the basement door. He's still demented. He's really getting active. She can take him to a restaurant for the first time in over a year. He went, he asked to go shopping. Where's his wife's name? He had a dystonic tremor from the antibiotics. That goes away. He points out things on TV and laughs. Um, he partially regains urinary and fecal continence. He gets out of bed, <laughs> goes to the bathroom, sits down, but he's got his diaper on. The wife says, let me take your diaper off, honey. And he goes to the bathroom. He has a newspaper. He's reading it upside down. Police has the right idea. He's starting to function. He's coming back. The hospice services are no longer needed. They go away. His wife sends me a letter. Thank you for giving me my husband back. Now, around this time, October of 2012, he stopped taking the coconut oil. It's a very rich taste. You know how coconut tastes, especially the oil. It's really rich. And he just wouldn't take it in any form. She couldn't get it into him. He was taking it by spoon. Now she couldn't mix them with soup or stews. And she couldn't persuade him. There wasn't any reasoning with me. He just wouldn't eat it. And look at that descent. He lost a lot of ground. One of my other patients told me that for his mom, who had Parkinson's, she, was, she didn't like the coconut taste either. So she got, he got her a refined coconut oil which took out some of that taste. I didn't know there was a refined. An unrefined. Refined, yeah, okay. Unrefined is what's very tasty. If they refine it, they take out some stuff and doesn't have as much of the taste. So I told the wife of this patient, get in the refined coconut oil. He doesn't notice it, starts taking it, bounces back up. So I got my answer. What does coconut oil by itself do something important? Yeah, look at that. Right around this time, I'm looking at an old textbook on Alzheimer's disease from 1985. And it says, you know, panothenic acid, which is a B vitamin, John, I'm almost done. Panothenic acid, the B vitamin, helps to make acetylcholine A, so you can make acetylcholine. So, oh, great. Let's give them panothenic acid, which by the way, can make people very irritable. So don't run out and give your loved ones panothenic acid. Talk it over with the doctors. Any of these things that you add, talk it over with the neurologist. Make sure there's no contraindication. And anything can cause side effects. Well, he tolerated the pinothenic acid very well. My wife didn't. It made her feel like crying for no reason at all. Many of my patients get irritable from like 100 milligrams of pinothenic acid. So after starting the pinothenic acid, now he's gaining a lot of cognitive improvements. One of the highlights of my career was at the Christmas party in that year. Well, he still didn't know who I was. I, he didn't remember that he knew me from 20 years earlier. But the, the psychologist from his clinic came for a Christmas party. He was standing up under his own power, talking to them, remembering them, laughing. This man who had been like that is now standing on his own power, remembering his friends, walks over to the dinner table to the head of the table for dinner. 
it was just the, one of the most wonderful experiences of my life and a blessing. Um, unfortunately, he kept getting diarrhea. It was clustered and difficile diarrhea, bloody, and it kept driving him down. He got it because he kept getting bronchopneumonia and they had to put him in antibiotics. And eventually got into such a coma, stupor, that they basically had to pull the plug and let him go. But he had five years of functioning, no longer in oblivion, that he wouldn't have had. So I hope this gives you a sense that there's a lot that we can do to help stave off dementia and treat it if you get it. And thank you very much. And we'll open up to questions now. So we have um, quite a few questions. Um, and, you know, if you want to raise your hand or um, we'll, we'll, you can take yourself off mute if you want to ask it. But this first question is from Linda. Um, she asks, how could I have recognized signs of depression earlier? Her husband shared almost everything with her, but it turns out he did not share his depression when she did not adequately adequately perceive it. Um, so she's just wondering if there is some way that um, she could have um, recognized the signs. Oh, sure, One, wonderful question. Um, there tends to be, and people are starting to get depressed, a blunting of affect, not like Parkinson affect, where the face gets frozen, but they're losing interest and the face I can't really define it, but I can, I see it. I can see it in people. A kind of humorlessness and a seriousness and um, not laughing as much, not getting as much enjoyment of the children and the grandchildren. A kind of, it's a term called anhedonia, A-N-H-E-D-I-O-N-A. -E They're just not getting as much pleasure. They're not as initiating as much. Do you want to go to the theater? No. Do you want to have family over for the holidays? No. Do you want to go out to the stores? No. Want to go for a walk? No. So they're turning away from the activities of daily living and the things that give joy. Um, kind of a blunt thing. Those would be some of your really early, early warning signs. And maybe a little trouble sleeping will go hand in hand with that. So, okay. Next. Thank you, doctor. That's that's very much um, that's very much in evidence in hindsight for me. Yes. Welcome. Another question um, about the um, taka, taka takatsubo. Takatsubo was wanted to know the spelling of it. Um, T a k e t s u b o. Okay. Takatsubo. And let me just add something about that. I'm sorry, this is, this is sad for me. Two days before my wife had her final descent into pneumonia and we're going to the hospital and die. It was very stressful, you can imagine. She was having pneumonia, I thought. And she refused to visit with the doctor on, on the, a web a Zoom meeting. Wouldn't go for antibiotics. I said, what do you mean I can go for antibiotics? It's just crazy. I was in such stress. I got up one morning, two days before the hospital, and I had atrial fibrillation. First time in my life. And I had gotten one of those little cardio devices, which are wonderful, K-A-R-D-I-A, -A, for my wife, because there's something abnormal with her pulse. A week earlier, I got this device. So I use it in myself. You just hold it next to your cell phone. I, I was an atrial fib. And I called my cardiolog a cardiologist I'd seen in 2018. I had a healthy heart back then. He got me in that same day. I had atrial fibrillation. I'm on Eliquis, a blood thinner. I never had that before. I never had, I had a bundle branch block. That stress changes the physiology of my heart. The, not the anatomy necessarily, but Takatsubo, changes the physical anatomy. You can see it, not, you don't need a microscope, just right there in, in, the, in, the, in the autopsy. You can see it's a different shape. It's just it's, it's staggering what stress can do to the physical body. So you gotta get control of it. I was to a very great extent, but not enough. 
Yeah, that's really stressful when you get to that stage of your loved one failing. But I would be in my, <laughs> I'd be in much worse shape if I hadn't been managing it. If I hadn't been sleeping, if I'd let the worrisome thoughts keep me up all night. So, okay, next question. Um, a number of people um, have indicated that they're here because of their concern about sleep and getting better sleep. Um, and one person asked, what supplements do you recommend for insomnia? Okay, get out your pen and paper. I'm glad you asked. Well, the main I'll things- taking copious notes. Okay. Just here. The main things I recommend, they work for me, they work for all my patients, CBD, cannabidiol. In a minute, I'll tell you where to get Let me tell you where to get it. Contact Craig Zaffe, Z-A-F-F-E. Um, I'll give you his phone number, 631-697-0296. He's a distributor, and his own brand is called OP, Optimum Performance. And get the OPN, capital N, for nighttime. That will really help you to sleep. But besides the CBD, cannabidiol, which won't get you stoned, but don't take it if you have a government job like military or um, air traffic controller, because we'll show as cannabinoids. But if that's not an issue, take it, it's no problem. Um, herbs like Gaia, G-A-I-A -A is a company, Gaia Herbs, Gaia Herbal, that make a wonderful product called Sleep Through. It's a capsule with four or five different herbs that really help to promote sleep. Take it half an hour before bedtime if you have trouble initiating sleep. Take it at bedtime if you have if you wake up during the night, interrupted sleep. Um, a homeopathic product called, silly name, Sleepology. So it's sleep, O-L-O-G-Y, Sleepology. Two little tablets just dissolve them under the mouth. You can take them at bedtime. If you wake up, you take one or two again, not after five or six in the morning, but before then, if you wake up, it's okay to take. Works like that. And melatonin is really helpful, but there's some versions that are better than others. The one I like is made by Life Extension Foundation. And you, I'll tell you what it's called. And you can get this on Amazon or from lifeextensionfoundation.com. And it's called melatonin, capital I, capital R, stands for instant release, slash XR, stands for extended release. So that will give you a little burst of melatonin right away to help you fall asleep. And if you're waking up in the middle of the night, that X extend release will be giving you some melatonin in the middle of the night to keep you asleep. It works. Next. Um, someone else asked about what about theanine, T-H-E-A-N-I-N-E? L-theanine is very good for stress during the day. Don't take it at bedtime because it's a little bit act activating. It's, it's one of the things I use for patients with attention deficit disorder, adult or juvenile, because it's clear, it helps the mind focus without being um, overactivating like, like Adderall. And it's not sedating, but it's a little bit on the activating side. So you wouldn't would not take that at bedtime, but okay during the day for calming. Okay. Um, so um, Linda says ashwagandha. Wonderful herb for anxiety. Wonderful herbs. She said A-S A S H W A. A S H W A. G A N D H A. Again, like um Gaia herbs is a very good version of that. It's one of the kings of Ayurvedic medicine over in India. It's one of the kings and very for very good reasons. Tremendously calming and it's adaptogen, helps you to cope with stress and deal with stress um, and helps them do sleep. So of course it's in the sleep through, the sound sleep sorry, by Gaia. Yes, Ashwagandha. Go ahead. Okay, well, I think that about wraps up the questions, I think. And we are just a little past one. 
So I don't want to want us to infringe on your time, Dr. Carlton, or- um... I have a question. Oh, please. What supplement companies do you recommend? Because I know a lot of them are not regulated. Do you have certain companies that you trust for dementia supplements? Yes. Um, above, all, above and beyond all is Life Extension Foundation. Dot com okay. all their, their products they are gmp manufacturers of vitamins they do really in-depth studies of the nutrients and the herbs that will work to protect the brain to protect the vessels serving the brain and they'll also talk about sometimes by prescription medications that work so although they sell vitamins and minerals and herbs they'll tell you their life extension They'll tell you if there's prescription meds that help to prolong life, extend your life. So they're very thoughtful and they have a magazine you can get um, for, if you join, I think it's $50 a year to see their products. But besides life extension, I trust Gaia. I trust Jarrow, J-A-R-R-O-W. And okay. for liquid herbs, um, Herb Farm, P-H-A-R-M herb farm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So the last question is, how do we get slides and notes? And I will be um, emailing everyone who's registered, attended and registered, uh, the recording link for today's presentation, a slide deck, the, um, a PDF of the slide deck, along with the um, links for our program update, as well as Dr. Carlton's contact information. And I will put together um, a recap of these, some of these resources um, that we talked about during the Q&A, the herbal um, uh, companies, suggestions for, um, from participants, as well as Dr. Carlton. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Carlton. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, the responses in our chat box say excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you, Joan. Oh, thank you, Dr. Carlton. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Carlton? Hi, so, still here. Okay, bye. Okay, take care.